What up, everyone? Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hi, everyone. I'm Heaven. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I threw that all off. And Hi, everyone. I'm Heaven. I'm Tracy. And welcome to another round with Heaven and Tracy. Ow, ow. Yeah. So we have a huge jam-packed show today. Jam-packed. It's Pride Month. Packed with jam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we love Pride. Uh, Yay. Our guest today is Teek Milan, the national spokesperson for GLAAD and writes about media representation and also is like a poet and just an awesome person. And also claps back routinely on people who yes. need to be clapped upon. <laughs> yes. We're going to be talking about media representation of LGBTQ folks with him. A quick note about this interview. We recorded this a little bit before Caitlyn Jenner's huge Vanity Fair cover, and that was an incredible, huge moment in media, but we don't really go into it in depth. But it's a great interview anyway, if I do say so myself. <laughs> also on this week's episode, the return of Trace the Joke Time, ah, our usual rounds, and a little Kanye segment that I can't believe took me this long to make up. <laughs> <laughs> But first, we got a lot of tweets, uh, emails, messages about a little wild story in the media. First and foremost, we have had approximately 8 million hundred requests from Twitter yes. asking that we address the case of Rachel Dolezal. Woo. All right. If you haven't heard of this story, I don't know what I'm assuming that you have a life outside of the internet. Which, <laughs> yes. Good for you, I guess, but you need to... But get your life together. Get your life together and, and tune in. hear this story. <laughs> so Rachel Dolezal is a woman who, until very recently, was the president of the Spokane, Washington NAACP. Uh, has been living her life as a mixed-race black woman. Turns out, she's white. Well, so... <laughs> <laughs> So Thursday night, this story broke because her parents, uh, her parents didn't even hold her down. This is the weirdest part to me, uh, honestly. Her parents were the ones who reported to the media that she's been lying about her race in perhaps several documents. Like that's the part that's still being like reported. She also claimed that like at least one of her adopted brothers, who was black, was her son, which apparently so isn't true. This story is definitely still being reported out, and it keeps I feel crazier. like it's very quickly going to turn sad. So yeah. let's enjoy the humor while we can. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of thing when it broke out, I was like, I do not want any takes on this. I don't want your opinion on this. I just want memes and facts. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're like an African-American professor who's studied passing from the 18th century. Right. On, you know, like your opinion's not valuable here. <laughs> <laughs> so the wild part of this story, well, there, there One are of the wild levels. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the wild part of this is she was doing all this and didn't have to? Right. Like, why? I read somewhere that her parents said that she did this to get back at them. Well, again, this is the part that's like, there have been some allegations of abuse, mm -hmm. unconfirmed things that I don't want to participate in conversation about because right. they're unconfirmed. Check back with BuzzFeed News, which has been <laughs> reporting the shit out of the story. But if you told me the story of a white woman mm -hmm. who moved to Washington to pass off as black mm -hmm. to do work with the NAACP and become an Africana studies professor. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, this is the worst black exploitation movie <laughs> never made. <laughs> and it's, the link that she went to <laughs> it's like to make this happen. Like the makeup that she started buying was darker. The uh, wigs and yeah. the weaves and the fake dreads and like she had this picture on Facebook talking about it's her 36th birthday and now she's gonna go natural. Madam uh -huh. Madam <laughs> No, <laughs> this job talking honky is honking for justice. <laughs> just, why? Why is this happening? <laughs> I was really trying to think of a tagline for that movie. Honking for justice. <laughs> what does that mean? I have no idea. But she's doing all of this in the name of racial justice work. Even in her oh, resignation God. letter from the NAACP. Mm -hmm. it, it was, was like, about, oh, I've done so much for this and that. And it, I didn't even think it was framed as I have done. It was like, this is all work that still needs to be done. We shouldn't focus on my personal story. But I feel story. like in saying that, she's making herself seem like, oh, the most important thing here to me is the work and not the fact that I'm doing all this crazy shit. I mean, like the yeah, that's the best wrong. possible statement she could make. Right. <laughs> but then there's another part where she was like, I've always been committed to like elevating the voices of marginalized people and now recently as in saying like thanks to this story and thanks to what I've done now everybody's being heard like mm. girl don't come looking for any cookies here there are none for you how did you feel about the story when you heard it first I was like what 
Yeah. And I was <laughs> and like, <it's> <laughs> what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I do have some thoughts. Mm. Number one, I'm certain that she is not well. Now, I mean, this is my speculation. Yeah. Because, I mean, the fact that a white person would give up all their white privilege. Listen, what's you going got on? to be some kind of like, you're doing this wrong. What? You are hustling backwards. You are going in the reverse. Ma'am, Listen. you could get a lot done being white. Right. Exactly. The NAACP was literally founded by white people. Yes. You don't they would have to be black take to you. be up in that bitch. You know what I'm saying? In fact, you could use your white privilege to do work that oh, perhaps black people that? cannot do. Perhaps <laughs> infiltrate some spaces where we're not typically allowed. But anyway, yes. so I knew that the conversation was going to turn towards mental health and I knew it was going to mm. happen quickly. If it comes out that she's got some serious problems, I would believe it. She would have all my sympathy. However, it does kind of annoy and irritate me. And this is something that my friend Nicole, who tweets as Tennessee T in Whiskey Woman on Twitter, hey girl, hey, she pointed this out and I was like, you know what, you are exactly right. But the swiftness with which people tend to give white folks the benefit of being sick, like mentally unwell when they mm. do some fucked up shit mm. is insane. It's astronomical. And we don't get, we as in people of color, right. we're not afforded that same luxury. Yeah. Like the German wings pilot who flew an airplane full of human beings into the side of a mountain, okay? Mm. But he was just depressed. Had he been any shade brown or any like hint of brown, if somebody yeah. had taken a brown marker and like made a mark on his face, they'd have been like, oh, he's a terrorist. He's right. he's malicious. Why people got get individuality? <laughs> what a, what like a privilege. We're pathologized as a community. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, another tricky part of this, I think, is that it makes it awkward for light skinned people <laughs> to <Yo>. exist. <laughs> <laughs> we got to walk around with on the timeline. We're like, shit, let me get it together. <laughs> Let me uh, get this Ancestry.com profile popping. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's hard because it's like, you. she could very well be black and have her skin tone. Mm -hmm. They're light-skinned people. Right. Or when they're like, well, black women get weaves all the time to have straight hair. And like, it's not an aesthetic thing at all. Like, that's not what this is about. Right. The way that some black people have jumped to her defense is not surprising to me because people are just whatever. Mm. But I just could not help thinking that if this was a black person who had done the opposite Nobody would be like, oh, well, they just want to be blah, 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 blah. Nah. I and mean, the crazy I think they would have been a century ago. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, they would have been all kind of like sad, self-hating, whatever. It's like nobody would defend a black person mm. in her position, which is crazy because if you think about it, there are far more like sensible reasons for a black person to pass for white right. in a society where your skin tone can often be like a death sentence depending on who you are, what you look like, where you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like whiteness is physical protection. Dark skin is like having a target on your back. Mm. So it makes sense that if somebody's like, well, I could be, you know, in the hood, like running around with all these sugar happy police and like worrying about like my kids and my safety. Or I could be white and go to the suburbs and maybe <laughs> survive. Like, you know what I mean? Woo. Yeah. But I mean, nobody, nobody would defend in if the situation was reversed, I don't think, which is messed up. Yeah, I mean, with the mental illness stuff, I don't want that angle to distract from all the other angles. Exactly, exactly. There are consequences for her passing. Yeah, and that's the thing that really gets me. I was having a conversation with somebody about, like, you know, what was that, like, the actual damage that she had done or whatever. Mm. And, like, she did this to reap the benefits, the few societal benefits of blackness, you know what I mean? like Which is like, what? Maybe um, you can get into well, <laughs> Howard? Well, I mean, so she... They still got white people at Howard, though. Right, right, right. But I'm saying, like, with the whole hate crime lawsuit that she had, mm. which, I mean, if you want details, you can go to BuzzFeed.com, the website. But, like, she was seeking, like, retribution and reparations and, like, monetary, like, relief for, for things that she didn't deserve for crimes that were never committed against her. Meanwhile, actual black people deserve reparations. Yeah, so we imagine have a if, running reparations tab. A running tab. <laughs> Thank you. And like imagine if like that case had gone through and she won. Yeah. So she's getting money for not being black. You know yeah. what I mean? Like to meanwhile, be clear, like, some of the like hate crime stuff. It's come out that she's had eight or nine reported hate crime incidents. Mm -hmm. And it's unclear to what extent some of them have been I don't know. It's unclear. Yeah. Those are unresolved. The validity officially. has not been yes. like yet. But, I mean, aside from that, like, 
in the the pictures of her like with all these super cool hairstyles and Yo, like she's got one with Kente Angela Kauf, like, Davis whatever. <laughs> exactly now those are things that I would look to as black privilege because I mean we've always been like the purveyors of cool quote unquote mm. even when it even though it's a burden yeah you know we're still like really freaking cool and I feel like there's like a <laughs> sense of like you know, I really feel like she went to Google and was like, latest yes. black trends. Okay, let me, let me Yo, get this head wig. Rap game crazy. Right, right. <laughs> let me get some fake dreads down in my ass. You mm. know what I mean? And it's just, it just seems like she was trying so hard to belong. Yeah. You know? And to just kind of like be a special snowflake, I guess. <laughs> special snowflake. <laughs> Pardon the pun. <laughs> We, I mean, we could talk about this forever, and I'm sure that there's going to be much more to this story that comes out. I feel like this story is not over, and it's already insane, so yeah. that means for it to continue, it has to be even crazier. So, Word. I don't know. People wanted to know our thoughts. Our thoughts are just like, Oh, also, girl. she said, <laughs> we are all from the African continent. <laughs> girl, leave. Leave. That is one of her, like, quoted <laughs> responses to, are you African-American? Oh, my God. <laughs> but see, that's the thing, though. Sure, sure, we're all from the continent of Africa, but not all of us are treated like shit because of it. Ooh. That's important. Bloop, bloop. You can't leave that out. Bloop, bloop, bloop. <laughs> all right, let's get back to the regular let's show. Let's move on. <laughs> Okay, guess what time it is. What time is it? So it's kind of time for Tracy's joke time. What do you mean kind of? <laughs> well, this is not actually one of my jokes. This is a joke that someone sent in. Ooh. I know. I typically like to tell my own jokes. Yeah, because you're an artiste. Thank you. Thank you. These are jokes that I've had years to perfect. Oh, uh, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> But we get a lot of people who send in jokes. Sometimes they're really funny. Sometimes they're like, uh, mine are better. Oh my um, god. <laughs> that's cute. actually that's actually not true. That's not true. I mean, they're I all good wouldn't jokes. say yours are significantly better. <laughs> Excuse me. But the way you tell what? them is better. Okay. I just learned how heaven really Oh my god, no, I love your jokes. It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> heaven likes y'all jokes better, so we fair. We want y'all jokes. <laughs> Um, but no, this one is really, really cute. It was sent to us by Danielle M. Hey, girl, hey. So, here's a guy. The guy's name is Jerome, obviously. <laughs> did you change that name or did they add that? No, I just added Jerome. <laughs> there has to be a Jerome. Of course. Of course. So, Jerome is taking his girlfriend to prom, right? And he wants to pull out all the stops. He wants a very nice tuxedo. He wants the limousine. He wants the great dinner reservations. He wants to make the night extra, extra special for his date, okay. right? So he goes to get the tickets, but the ticket line is really, really long. <laughs> but he stands and he waits and he gets the tickets. He's like, okay, bet. Now I need to go get the limousine. He goes to the limousine company. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I guess this is before the internet it happened when you can do everything <laughs> online. But he goes to the company to rent a limo, but the limo line is really, really long. Oh, God. But he stands in line. He waits. He eventually gets the limo. Goes to buy her some flowers. Nice little corsage. He goes to the florist, but the flower line is really, really long. How but he's tiny is this town? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously very, very teeny. Flower line is really, really long. So he waits and he waits. Eventually, he gets the flowers. It's prom night. He and his dad are dancing, <laughs> just cutting a rug, just dancing the night that? away. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what those words were you just said. Cutting a rug? <laughs> what is that? Have you never heard the phrase cutting a rug? What does that mean? It just means dancing. Like, but what's like the, tearing it up what's at the club? The rug got it. <laughs> well, if you're dancing on a rug and like your feet are like moving all crazy, then oh, you're... okay, I see it, I see it. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's... <laughs> I threw off the whole momentum of the joke. <laughs> <No. laughs> so uh, they're they're so they're cutting the rug. <laughs> I'm so sorry. A I said rug, it out Kevin, loud. They're cutting a rug. <laughs> Our so they're being cut. So they're dancing. <laughs> okay. As the youth of the kids. <laughs> Are you as the drunk? Youth of the day, I'm not. That's the crazy thing. As the youth of the day would say, they were tearing the club up. Okay. Okay. Is that something that the kids still say? <laughs> I don't even know. Yes. Anyway, they're at prom. They're dancing. His date wants some punch, right? Mm -hmm. So he walks over to the punch bowl and there's no punch line. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Reader, Don't hate listener. me. <laughs> it's all Danielle M. Thank uh, you, girl. That was so funny. Shout out to Danielle. Oh cool. my gosh. Can't believe you never heard cutting the rug before. We 
We are so very excited to have Teek Milan on the show. Yay. He's the national spokesperson for GLAAD. GLAAD is an organization that looks at a lot of media coverage of LGBTQ folks. And he does a bunch of other cool things. Great writer. We're so happy you're here. Fantastic suffer of fools, I have learned. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to the stud. Hey. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Hmm. So we'd like to start off by asking everyone, what do you do and why? What do I do and why? Okay, so what I do a number of things. So like you said, I'm a national spokesperson for GLAAD. I talk about a lot of our trans issues on a national level. I'm also a media consultant. I do media consulting for lots of other folks. I'm a writer. I'm a poet. And I'm also a husband. So these are all the things that I do. So like my whole thing is just, you know, trying to be a man of the people and just trying to be a part of that contingent and a part of the population of folks that are trying to like move the cultural needle, you know, towards something that's really inclusive and um, equal for all folks. So, so that's what I do. I'm trying to change the world and shit like that. Hey, as Heaven likes to say, you contain multitudes. Yes. yes. Thank you yeah, for quoting me on that. <laughs> <laughs> Not Walt Whitman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I never heard him say it personally. Uh, as Brother Walt Whitman said, <laughs> in your capacity as a consultant or a media trainer advocate, you look at a lot of the ways media writes about trans stories in particular. Mm -hmm. And I think with Jenner's story now being more in the national spotlight, that's mm -hmm. something more media companies have to like reckon with in in a way that's like not what it used to be like even a year ago. Yeah, that's true. You know, I think trans people right now, we're definitely having like a surge in visibility. We've been having this mm. over the last couple of years, right? Because yeah. even like five years ago when South Park had the trans episode. Oh do you remember that? When I um, don't because I don't. I don't remember South, <laughs> South Park. Okay, South Park is my shit. Really? So, I love that show. I do. I do. Tell Wait, me I missed more. this episode. <laughs> okay, so this episode with Mrs. Garrison, Mr. Garrison turned to Mrs. Garrison, and oh, then I Mrs. Garrison decided to detransition and was like searching for like her penis throughout the entire okay. episode. It was really, it was fucked up. It was really <laughs> great, right? But now we go five years later, South Park mm. has a whole episode when they're talking about the trans kid and the bathroom situation, and it was done in a way that was really funny um, and really like on par with like the correct language and kind of the ideas, right? Really? So I think what was the what was the trans kid in the bathroom situation? Okay, so. This this is what happened. So Cartman kept blowing up the girl's bathroom, right? And Wendy was like, Cartman, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Cartman, stay out the fucking girl's bathroom. He was like, I can stay here because I'm trans. And they were oh. like, you know what? That's fucked up. You're not trans. You're just doing this to be in the bathroom. So they're having this whole back and mm. forth. So Cartman goes to the principal and he's like, this is discrimination. I'm transgender. I want to take shit in the girl's bathroom. I'm transgender. I looked it up. That means I can use the girl's shitter. You are not transgender, Eric. You don't even know what that means. Yeah, huh? It means I live a life of torture and confusion because society sees me as a boy, but I'm really a girl. All right. Well, if you identify yourself as a girl, you must find yourself attracted to boys. Is that right? That's actually not true. I can be transgender without it having anything to do with the gender I'm attracted to. Check the state bylaws. All right. Listen, Eric. Erica. Listen, Eric. You must know why we can't have you in the girl's bathroom. All I know is I'm transgender and you can't make me go to the bathroom with the cisgenders. And so the whole time that was happening, we found out that Stan's father was really the girl who um, sings that song. She has the black hair. She looks an older looking woman. She's like 17, but she looks like she's 35. Lord. Yes. Oh, my God. Lord the God. We love yeah. Lord. I love, I love Lord. Lord. I love Lord, too. <laughs> I love, I love she does too. not look 16. I do agree. Okay, right. So, great, any, so anyway, they found out that um, Stan's father is actually Lord's, right? So they're having this whole... This <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway so that's what happened in the episode but it was, it was really funny and it was done really respectfully as mm. opposed to what they did five years ago and the reason that that's changed is because of the work that a lot of organizations are doing the work like GLAAD and the work that a lot of trans people are doing around mm. representation in yeah. media what have been some meaningful pop culture representations for you that's you a good know, question that is a good question because there has a you mean like as far as like trans folks yeah I mean it can Ciao. be literature it can be Maybe an episode of South Park. <laughs> <laughs> that was one. Yes. That was a favorite. <laughs> um, and of course, Laverne and Janet. Yeah. You know, uh, we always mm -hmm. go back to Laverne and Janet because really they're like the two most consistent. Um, uh, for those who don't know, that's Laverne Cox and, uh, and Janet Mock. Mock. I'm on first name basis because like they're in my phone. Hey. Uh, I'm jealous. <laughs> anyway. My entire uh, body just turned green. <laughs> <laughs> those are my boos. Shout out to them. But we always, you know, refer to them because they're really the most uh, visible mm. and, you know, and have done so much work as far as not just pop culture and entertainment and journalism but also around advocacy too so you know I look to them, them too and, and Laverne always talks about being a possibility model yes you know, I love that phrase so me much too. me too and she's really modeled that for so many people yeah. I, I would never be so arrogant to think that someone should model their lives after me but the idea of possibility 
the, the idea that I get to live my dreams out in public. Um, hopefully we'll show other folks that that is possible. And so I prefer the term possibility model to role model. Nice. My mentor, Alexis DeVoe, just wrote a book called Yabo, and the main character is a black uh, intersexed young man, mm -hmm. an intersex trans man, um, who actually that's going to be turned into a play, and I'll be playing him in, in an off, oh, off Broadway play. That's Turn up. That is so, so exciting. Do you know when... Um You'll be performing in it? Like when well, it it's, this is probably not going to be until next year. We're just starting production right mm. now with Justin Talks and writing and getting this done. But that's going to be coming out uh, probably next year. We'll um, be there. I would love to see this. Yeah, it'll be great. I'll make mm -hmm. sure that BuzzFeed gets a ticket. Hey. Hey. Yeah, so really that's it as far as like the representation. You know, and I was having, I just did, a, um, I was at the Black Trans Advocacy Conference a couple weeks ago. And I was talking to them about how when I first my, started my transition in 2007, this was before like visibility was like a strategy for trans folks. Mm. You know, I was like on Downlink and Black Planet. Remember that? Yes. I remember that? I remember Planet. Black Planet. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know what Downlink is, though. What is that? Black Planet, absolutely. <laughs> and Down Downlink was a whole other like incarnation of... Uh of Black Planet, but mm. I remember being on these websites and just stalking trans men, particularly mm. black trans men, you know, and these are guys that are just existent in the world, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So that was my role models, my possibility models, just these guys who, where some of them were low or no disclosure, some of them were very out, but they were just very trans and very just existing in their bodies. So that's, that was what really meant a lot to me mm -hmm. coming out, you know? That's awesome. So in the bio that's on your website, it says that you have media trained national advocates like Cece McDonald and Gina Rosero. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Cece McDonald is a black trans woman who has become a major advocate in, in trans advocacy over the last few years. She is involved in a, a racialized transphobic attack. And while defending herself, her attacker was killed. And she ended up, she was charged with murder. Mm -hmm. And she fought those charges ended up getting released two years later after serving two years in a men's prison. And while she was in that prison, uh, Laverne Cox became a confidant and a best friend of hers. Mm. And they also have started production in the Free CC documentary, which I think the production is done, actually. So they're going to be working on this uh, documentary. So CC is becoming a major advocate, uh, particularly around uh, trans women in prison and prison reform. Mm. Yeah. What exactly does that entail? Like when you're media training advocates, like what are the most important things for you to... Like train them, them on, train yeah. them on, like the, the most important bits of knowledge for you to impart on your advocates. Whenever I train somebody, particularly somebody who's trans doing their advocacy work, I try to tell, I tell them to picture in their mind that one person in their life who just doesn't get it, mm. who just really can't get it and what you can say to them to make them understand you. We're not talking about people that hate you, right? Mm, We're right. just talking about like that cousin the that's The reachable like, people. Like, <laughs> I love you, but yeah. I don't understand what's yeah, going on with yeah. you. You know what I mean? What kind of conversation can you have with those people? And that really starts people off. Like, when Cece, I was trying to get her to like write her talking points and thinking about you know, what she wants to say about her life, and she just couldn't get it until I told her to think about that one person. That one person for her was her mother. Mm. And when she did that, then her story started to come out. So then once the story starts to come out, you know, it's important that... You know, I give people the space to have their authentic voice, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, still be able to talk to, like, the intersecting issues. So if you want to talk about your personal story, but also be able to pivot this back to uh, the larger issues that we're looking at. Like, yeah. you know, uh, if it's, if it's you know, poverty or if it's incarceration or if it's, like, in, like you know, racial trans misogyny or racialized misogyny. Like, these larger issues that still, uh, that we constantly have to be making sure it's in within the public consciousness, you know, aside from just talking about our personal story. So it's important that that people can be able to structure that for me during our, our um during our trainings. I like to think that we're naturally good. I like to think that people are really good, mm -hmm. right? And I think that all of us have a sense of like love and justice and fairness, you know? And if we can appeal to those um, aspects to a person mm -hmm. in a person's heart, then you'll be able to change their minds, you know? So in a lot of the sort of narrative around trans stories, which Jenner alluded to, is like Jenner was saying, I hate the girls stuck in a guy's body like narrative. Mm -hmm. I'm me. I'm a person. This is who I am. I'm not stuck in anyone's body. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of the conversation is generally about like, well, at one age I felt yeah. this and then. Do you feel like that's a useful narrative, a helpful narrative? I think it's a narrative. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, you know, the trans experience isn't a monolithic thing. Right. You know, it, the experience looks different for everybody. So there may be a trans person that absolutely feels like they were born in the wrong body. Like that mm. really sums up how they feel. Yeah. I know for me, I never felt I was born in the wrong body, but I definitely felt that I was evolving away from this girl or this woman that I thought I was or I thought I was supposed to be. Mm. You know, and I know some trans people 
who just never at any point in their life ever identified as the gender that was assigned to them at birth. Mm. You know, some trans folks were like, you know, my transition is just my medical experience. It's not right. necessarily the crux of my identity. Therefore, I don't disclose my transness. Mm. Right. It's just my my personal medical history, which is nobody's business. So right. that's what I think we have to understand is like the transgender experience is something that um, it's, it's a, a multitudinous. Is that a word? It is now. It is now in this dude. Multitude, <laughs> multitudinous. <laughs> Multitudity. <laughs> it's a multitudity experience. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think what's interesting to me is we spent like a the better part of last year saying the phrase Black Lives Matter. Right. Mm-hmm. And in that time, we've also seen increased reporting on the death of trans uh-huh. people of color. Right. And somehow that's not a part of the conversation of Black Lives Matter. Yeah, and that's and that's so fucked up. You know what I'm saying? It's and this is the thing. This is my this is my beef mm. I have with cis folks. Okay, let but us cis- speak <laughs> on it. Okay, for the people who don't know, what does cis mean? Okay, so cisgendered people are non-trans people, and we use cisgender as a way of saying instead of saying like you know transgender and regular people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. you know, give or, everybody a label. If you got to give one person a label, give, give everybody, everybody a label. Is that way you don't other people? Mm-hmm. So we saying cis, and I don't know who came over some academic. Thank you, whomever you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, <laughs> so cisgender folks are non-trans folks. So in this is the thing particularly we have advocates like people that are you know racial justice advocates black advocates um who are not understanding intersectionality are not understanding intersecting intersecting issues and that's mm. how black trans lives gets erased in in black lives matters movement now to sit and i also want to say like the black lives matters movement the slogan in the movement was started by three queer black women mm. and also um, a couple gay men, one being Darnell Moore, who's a really good friend of mine. So I just want to put that out there and say it's not it's not them, right, you right, know, right. but as as the slogan has taken off and as as, you know, different like facets of the movement are taken off. We're seeing that a lot of times that trans people are erased. Women are erased. You know, we mm. talk about Black Lives Matter, but they're not talking about all of the women that have mm. been killed by the police. The police have Ugh. killed, I think, 19 black women this year That's alone. Insane. You know, but no one was talking about that. They had a rally for uh, Rakia Boyd, if I'm not mistaken, in Union Square, and it was crickets. Mm. <laughs> crickets. I didn't even know that happened. Ex- exactly. You know what Damn. I'm saying? So this, so this is what I'm saying. So a lot of times we have this Black Lives Matters, but it gets contracted by misogyny. It gets confined by trans misogyny. So what's what I'm seeing a lot is we are having to take up the slack, right? Black queer people, black mm. trans people, we're constantly having to say we matter, we matter, we matter. And it's tiring. Yes. It's, it's Ooh, exhausting. It. <laughs> yes. It's exhausting to constantly try to prove your self-worth and your humanity mm. to people that's supposed to be just like you. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Like I just saw um, a picture online these two beautiful, beautiful individuals, um, Jamal Lewis and his, what he called his muckmates. Uh, I think his name is Kenny, if, I, if I'm not, if not mistaken. He's our muckmate. Because <laughs> they run amok. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Running okay. amok. I suppose. <laughs> I think it's adorable. That's so these are, these are very two uh, black femme genderqueer people who were at the rallies in New York City for the Black Lives Matter talking about police brutality uh, and, and, and the uprising in, in Baltimore and Freddie Gray. And they're dancing and chanting and voting. You know mm. what I'm saying? And they're there, but what, what happens when they're killed? What happens when the police want to call them faggots and beat them up? Where mm. are all of you? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So it's a it's a bittersweet feeling. You know, the solidarity that we as black queer people show to all the black folks, but all the black folks not showing the same solidarity mm-hmm. with us. Mm. So that is a huge problem. Mm. I thought I knew what you were getting ready to say, but I was, I was wrong. Sometimes I don't know everything. But there was a picture <laughs> that I saw. Um, this only happens twice a year. So I got one more time to be black. <laughs> Um, But there was a picture that um, I think Jamila Lemieux um, Mm. tweeted and it was a picture of like a wall somewhere in America and like there were like posters like one said Black Lives Matter another one said like different variations of Black Lives Matter like Black Trans Lives Matter Black Queer Lives Matter etc etc and someone came along and with red spray paint painted over like the Black Lives Matter or Black Whatever Lives Matter Mm -hmm. with all to change each and every one to All Lives Matter I'm so over that I got so so angry. I'm so over that bullshit. Like, let somebody else have something. Okay, so you know how that cop was like, fuck your breath? Mm-hmm. It felt like if this was like a movie, you'd be like, mm, a little on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> the whole year being like, Black Lives Matter, and you're like, fuck right. your breath. <laughs> okay. You're living like the worst crash yes. plot line. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Ever. So first of all, it's, it's just absurd true. on that level. <laughs> right, right. But it's, it's just so disheartening. Yeah. It is. It and is. like, as, as loud as we have to yell and scream, like, well, me as like a straight black woman, I know mm-hmm. that 
the more layers and like the more like labels and others that you have, the louder you have to scream. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. And I know I'm tired each and every day, so I can't even imagine. And like one of the things we wanted to ask you was like, how do you keep your sanity and how do you like guard your energy as you're taking on willfully the burden of having to teach so many people like the basic parts of like your humanity and Cece's humanity. You know what I mean? How are you not insane? Because, see, the, the, <laughs> yes. the thing is... <laughs> right. I just say yeah. Right. See, but the thing is is that you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to talk to real like hateful ass, ignorant ass people. Mm. Mm. If you don't like me, you don't like me, I don't like you. You know, that's a consensus. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you stay your ass over here, I'm going to stay my ass that. over here. <laughs> you know? That's fine. Simple yeah. and easy to do. <laughs> Simple and easy to do. So a lot of the talk and a lot of the you know of the helping and the advocating is happening with folks like you all right it's happening with allies it's happening with people in the community it's happening with the mo- movable middle it's about people that we can that we can move and shape it's not about the people that really want to hate us and kill us because they're always going to want to hate and kill right. us mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying and even having these conversations with other black cisgender straight people about intersectionality it feels good because I just I want to talk to my people about this that's how I want to talk to I don't need to talk to nobody else mm-hmm. honestly you know what I'm saying so it's, it's so it, it feels good and that's part of the reason why we did the This Is Love campaign. We did a This Is Love campaign, media campaign, which highlighted uh, supportive and loving black families who supported and loved their LGBT family member. Mm-hmm. Because to counter this narrative that black people are the most homophobic, that they're that we're the most uh. conservative and things like that, right? So we did that. And, and I found that that is just absolutely untrue, even having conversations with like cisgender straight black folks about intersecting issues, about queerness, mm-hmm. about embodied femininity or embodied masculinity. There is an openness to it. So there's mm-hmm. this possibility. You know, I don't believe that we're all a bunch of like, Uncle Ruckus, conservative <laughs> preacher types or whatever, uh-huh. you know? So A yeah. lot of the trans figures that have rised up in the media rose up. <laughs> rised up. <Nice. laughs> um, Has arisen. So, like, it's folks like uh, Laverne Cox or Janet Mock who mm-hmm. are beautiful and super femme. Mm-hmm. You don't really see that much room for people who are not like traditionally super femme or traditionally super masculine. Or who don't like fit a particular mold. Right. So there's not a lot of room for gender queer people. And there's also a lot of beauty politics. Mm-hmm. But that's right. just if you're if you're a visible person, those politics are are bound whether you're trans or not right mm-hmm. you know but i think what i love about the queer community and gender queer folks is that they are really forcing people to see them mm. and forcing people to take notice that you know gender and gender expression is not a binary thing but it, it it's it's a spectrum and that there are people that exist within the blue and the pink i personally i like my blue mm-hmm. i'm good in my little box i like my blue but i love people that don't and that's okay but gender queer folks are making it known you know yeah. so and that's the thing about queer people. I really think that we're the future. You know what I'm saying? We're hey. really, I'm saying we really are showing people like different ways of humanity, like showing that humanity can exist in a, in a multitudinous, a multitudity <laughs> <Hey>. of ways. <laughs> <laughs> great know? word. Great word. Yeah. Um, this conversation makes me think of Tumblr and Trans Visibility Day mm. and like how much like trans activism I see every day among people like half my age. Like, Tumblr is a shit too. Tumblr is yeah. Tumblr's so amazing. smart. Tumblr, Tumblr and Twitter. Amazing. The love, kids love, are all right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're all right. Yeah. So a lot of the stories, especially like in cable news, Mm -hmm. I know you talk a lot about like the narrative of trans people, but like also the visuals of like these cable packages where it's like the B-roll is like a lot of the body, like the focus, especially for trans people is like we need images of body stuff. Yeah. And that's like the primary interest. Yeah. Do you consult in any way about not just the narrative, but the visual stuff? All the time. All the time. Just What do you see often and like what are you trying to tell them not to do? A lot of times it's, you know... We'll go to, I'll go into a place, uh, to like a magazine or a, t- a TV studio or whatever. And what they want to do is they want to show a lot of like the trans, just like the physical trans, like somebody put it on their makeup mm. or, you know, put it on their wigs and things like that. But I'm telling them we have to talk about the, the experience, like the lived experience, not so much the body politics, because the trans experience, like I said, it looks different for everybody. So people's bodies are going to look different when they're trans. And so to look at one body and say, this is how a trans body is supposed to look, mm. you know, isolate so many other people. So I think right now, let me tell you, when Laverne was on Katie Couric, and Katie Curry tried to ask about her genitals. She pivoted away from that in such a way that I really think that that was really a turning point in her career. And that mm. was a, really a shift, a monumental shift in the conversations we've been having. Yeah, I'm curious because, you know, I think all of us want to be educated and people who are not educated about this or, or familiar with sort of transgenders, they're preoccupied with the genitalia question. And I'm wondering if you think 
that's true and how if, if you have the same feelings about that story. I do feel like there's a preoccupation with that and I think that the preoccupation with transition and with surgery objectifies trans people and then we don't get to really, really deal with the real lived experiences the reality of, of trans people's lives is that so often we're targets of violence we experience discrimination disproportionately to the rest of the um, um, community um, our unemployment rate is twice the national average if you're a trans person of color it's four times the national average the homicide rate in the LGBT community is highest amongst trans women and if we if we when we focus on transition we don't actually get to talk about those things there was there's a young woman named is Elon Nettles uh, who um, on August 17th was just walking down the street with some friends you know minding her own business and she was catcalled by a couple of guys and one of them they and once they realized she was trans she was beaten into a coma and five days later she died this is the reality of so many trans people's lives in this country, trans women of color, who are, whose lives are in danger simply for being who they are. And, and we're looking for justice for Elan's murder, and we're looking for justice for so many trans people across this country. And by focusing on bodies, we don't focus on the lived realities of that oppression and that discrimination. You're so well spoken about. You know, that was very well put. So right now, honestly, people know because of that, they know not to ask about people's, you don't ask nobody about their mm -hmm. genitals. Ain't nobody right. asking you in the street, don't Just right. hopefully exactly. a thing you've already known. Like, should be, you learned like, really. that you're like three. Don't yeah. ask about people's <laughs> privates. Right. <laughs> Hello. Let's do better, y'all. Don't talk about the no-no spots. <laughs> yes. Don't. Let's Elementary just, school lessons. <laughs> really, let's go back to that. <laughs> let's just go back to that, you know? Mm. So I, that has really changed a lot of folks. And so now when I find these people are like, okay, we know that's bad to talk about that. So then, so what do we do now? You know, mm -hmm. so it's like it, it, forcing them to think harder and work harder and dig deeper to talk about my lived experience instead of worrying about, you know, what I got going on in my pants and who likes it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Stop being so lazy, everybody. Thank you. Do think better. A bit. Google it. <laughs> Google it. Google it. That's an option. <laughs> you literally walk around this world with a computer in your pocket. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Ignorance is willful. If you don't know something right now, because that's because your ass don't want to know. Exactly. So in college, me and my friends <laughs> made a little theme song for uh, this so moment. Right now. Google that shit. Hey, hey. Google that shit. Hey. hey. That's literally it. That's the whole song. Google that shit. Kevin, we're going to get you a beat. <laughs> yeah. you You're laughing. We need a I'm producer serious. on this. <laughs> Oh, we, perhaps Jean Grey. Uh, Maybe Don will love the we'll almighty Don with this Google that shit song. We'll see. <laughs> no, but seriously. Google, Google that shit. Um, we'd like to wrap up our interviews with a segment that we affectionately call Pew, 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 Pew. Finger gun. That's what it's called? That's what it's called. Oh. Everyone's so underwhelmed when they hear it. <laughs> They're like, really? So it just what means is? like rapid fire questions. <laughs> These are guns. These okay, are guns. those are guns. So okay. Just to translate like, what's happening gunfire. here. <laughs> okay. It's so no, weird. Maybe we should do better with this segment. Anyways. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, rapid fire so, questions. Lots of random questions. Oh, First shit. question is always okay. How do you feel about squirrels? No pressure, but this will determine our friendship going forward. <laughs> I love squirrels. I fed uh, them a bag of peanuts yesterday. Wow. What? Is that a bad? Was that the bad? Was you that are the, the wrong first and answer. only person. You're the wrong to side speak of history right now. Positively about squirrels. <laughs> How y'all not like squirrels? In the stew. Why? Okay, why do you like squirrels? Let's well, talk about that. I live in the Bronx, and where I live is just, there's just a bunch of squirrels everywhere, and they're, they're cute. And I feed they don't bother y'all out there? Not really. Maybe I mean, the Bronx squirrels you. are different. They'll follow mm -hmm. you around. I feed them a lot. So see, I, oh, see, I that's where you fucked up. I you feed them, they're gonna keep coming around. Like and be but do they? We do you feel like they respect your space? They do respect my space. One tried to get into my apartment, and I almost oh had my a fit. God. You <laughs> How can you enjoy an animal that tries to break it, in your crib? It, where it's you had and your a wall. Let me tell you, where your family stay. I had like the window open, and then the screen right, and it got between the window and the screen. Oh my god! To put a nut there, it was oh a my walnut. God. <laughs> so me and my cat holding my cat like <laughs> <"Get it." laughs> holding my cat like a gun. <laughs> You know, oh, but I like squirrels. Man. Uh, uh, we so, will tolerate your opinion of squirrels. Great. Thank but you, you should you should really know going forward, don't trust them motherfuckers. <laughs> don't trust them. Have don't your eye them. always looking they around. They do not respect you. Have you been traumatized by a squirrel? Oh my god. Loki, yes. If we had more time. <laughs> yes. All right, let's awful. get to some other questions. Okay. okay, okay. Who are your heroes? Uh my mother. That's my biggest hero. Mommy. God rest her soul. My mother died last last oh, summer. So sorry. Yeah, so my mom. Uh, what was your first pet and what was his name? Um, my first pet. Um, Don't say it was a squirrel. You gotta go. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> no, my first pet was a dog. Was a dog named Sheba. Oh, Sheba is a great name for a dog. Yep. Uh, do you speak any other languages? 
Uh, no, slang. Okay, that counts. <laughs> that <Yeah>. counts. Hey. <laughs> what is your favorite current guilty pleasure? Oh, The Blacklist. I watched a whole season Ooh. of it in like two days. Somebody told me it wasn't good. They lied to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. They lied. I'm going to check it out. I'm always looking for TV recommendations. Black Heaven is shit. all into that. I will watch, watch every TV show. Okay. <laughs> it's We're going to watch the Black <laughs> too. All of them. What is something that your fans would be surprised to know about you? I'm a real homebody. I really like to just uh, sit by in my underwear and play Xbox. That's what I do in my leisure time. That sounds I'm like... Not, I don't turn up too much. That sounds like a great life. I work too hard. I work Once I'm done working, I just want to sit. I mean, especially in your emotionally intensive role. Yeah. I'm trying yes. to save the world yes okay. <laughs> you deserve a couple of hours okay, in your drawers just... playing xbox <laughs> all I do. Thanks. okay i feel like this is a good question to end okay. with what do you think is wrong with men oh okay so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you've been waiting a lifetime <laughs> to let this out there's so many things you know honestly i think that uh i think that masculinity is really fragile mm. and everybody tries Ooh. to act like it's not and when you act like masculinity isn't as fragile as it is, it becomes mm. really violent. Mm. This is why this is why women, you know, get spit on and hit and shot and slashed you know, uh-huh. when women, um, you know, reject their advances. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't, it's, fellas, it's not that serious, dog. Uh, you my know, gosh. so that's the problem. Masculinity is very, very fragile, and it's acting like it's not. So we need to have a lot, you know, more honest conversations about masculinity. Perfect. A man with his feelings hurt is the worst thing in the world. Ooh. Hide your kids, hide your wives. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> men going and driving to Temecula to fight a m- another man over a tweet, but women are the emotional ones, right? <laughs> okay. Listen. Okay. Exactly. All right, Chauncey. <laughs> sure. I'm the emotional one. Like, why are you at 3 p.m. commenting not all men? <laughs> What's going on with your life? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Get a job. <laughs> Raise your kids. Um. Do something. Uh, this has been great. Yo, yes. thanks so much for being on the so show. I'm glad that you Thank came y'all. through. Where can people find you? What are you trying to plug? What's yes. going on? You can find me uh, on Instagram at the Mr. Milan. You can find me on Twitter at uh, the Mr. Milan. Next up, um, I'm speaking at this Pride Parade in New York City. Um, my wife and I, shout out to my wife, Kim. June 20th will be the Grand Marshals for the Hudson Pride Parade. Aww. Um, I love yeah, Pride I'm, Parades. Pride Parades are great. Yo, and I, I'll literally definitely have some more. the first time I went, I cried. Did you really? Because <laughs> I'm a baby. <laughs> The baby. Yes. Um, On June 24th, Mm -hmm. Kim and I are hosting a thought leadership, a TED-style thought leadership in Toronto as a part of the Toronto Pride Parade. So we're going to have 10, like, thought influencers uh, and artists to do, like, a 10-minute thing each. And we're going to do, like, a whole story. It's going to be, like, um, queer griot ship and talk about the importance of storytelling in queer communities. So that's happening on June 24th, the Thought Influencer Symposium. I'm also hosting Black Pride on uh, June 28th in Toronto. TeakMilan.com. There you go. For all of my updates. Yay. Yay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining this us. This was thank fantastic. Y'all. This was a lot of fun. And thank you for drinking with us. Yeah. I feel like it's been a long time since anybody has had a drink. Cheers and queers. Yay. Yo, that's hey. so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to say that forever now. <laughs> And now for some inspirational words from Kanye West. In my fight to be able to create, I've had to assert who I was because I wasn't being recognized as such. And for me to say, hey, you know, I can create in this space, I can do this. No one wants me to say that. No one wants me to say that out loud, you know? And until I'm able to do it, I'm gonna say it. Now that I'm able to do it a bit more, I can say it a bit less. I mean, I can let the work speak. Yeah. But, you know, if you've given everything you had, every hour you had, every dime you had, every relation you had trying to create, and everything stopped you, at a certain point you have to scream for what you believe in. And it's okay to believe in yourself. All right. We are almost at the end once again. Who are you buying around for, Tracy? I am buying around for the hilarious David Allen Greer. Mm -hmm. So there was a show on TV once upon a time in the 90s. You were probably like three. (laughs) It was called In Living Color. In Living Color still is. I mean, honestly, like some of the sketches have not aged very well. Mm. Political correctness was not as big of a thing like in 93. Mm. So there are sometimes there's some sketches there's some words that they use and it kind of makes you cringe. But overall, like, I mean, it was a very, very brave and bold sketch comedy show. Yeah. It gave us Jamie Foxx. It gave us, um, what's the white man's name? 
Jim Carrey. It was Jim I Carrey. I Jim Carrey. <laughs> it was the entire Wayans family. Yes. And you know it's like 27 of them. Yes. So they can all trace their roots back to In Living Color. And like just the way that they did like social commentary and just like black pop culture funny stuff mm. was so amazing. So David Allen Greer is a comedian and actor who got his start, his mainstream start on In Living Color. And he also hosted Saturday Night Live at least once. Yeah. And on Saturday Night Live, he played Maya Angelou. Oh, yes. I love this so much. <laughs> and so there were three different sketches. There was Maya Angelou reciting a poem for, like, regular consumer products. Like, there was one for Fruit Loop. There was one for Pennzoil. <laughs> and there was one for Butterfinger. <laughs> Hilarious. And now, Maya Angelou. For Fruit Loops. Toucan, Sam, you leap on the back of the wind. Lodestone to assorted fruit flavors. Phoenix of the dawn's one smile. We gave you, Toucan, Sam, life. You, Toucan, Sam, give us loops of fruit. Fruity loops. Fruit loopies. Swimming in the churning, frothy mother sea of milk. Kellogg's appreciates consumer comments. P.O. Box 221, Battle Creek, Michigan. A prism of fruity color. A cornucopia of over 40 fruity tastes. The orange, the apple, the grape, the pomegranate, the quince. The kumquat, the kiwi, the plantain, the This has been Maya Angelou for Fruit Loops. This is basically what we sound like on Drunken Debates. <laughs> basically. That's why we're trying to channel Maya Angelou. <laughs> now, there was there was that little blip. There was the smudge on the resume. Oh Chocolate News was not. <laughs> but we will not mark that on his legacy. We will not, we will not let that define David Allen Greer. Yes. Because he also was the, the uh, Reverend Leon Lonnie Love on Martin, which is like one of the best comedic roles, I swear to God of anybody on any sitcom. And he's just like mad talented. I don't want to see more of him. David Allen Greer, if you're listening, come to the studio. <laughs> Let us ply you with liquor <laughs> and just like talk to us. Let us study at your feet and maybe do some Maya Angelou poems. I don't know. <laughs> David Allen Greer around on me and like legitimately come come to the show. Email us something. Heaven, who are you buying around for? So me? I <laughs> always crazy. Oh yay. I love the office. I know that's not like a literally millions of people love The Office. Right. <laughs> it was on for like 10 seasons. <laughs> I'm not new to saying this, but it is such good pop culture comfort food for me. Like Aww. if I'm sick or if I'm like just like feeling down, whatever, it's like such a fun show to rewatch. I love that phrase, pop culture comfort food. That would be a good podcast name. Uh, Somebody copyright should do me. It. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's such a good show. It has so much heart. I forgot as I was rewatching it how much they spend really developing the character. Like I feel like I I carry these characters with me. Aww. Like they feel like real people. And do you know you know the movie Boyhood that was like a big Sundance hit and mm -hmm. and the kid grew up in the twelve years they made the movie. <laughs> people don't really give TV shows credit for how much they really allow for growth in people mm -hmm. obviously it wasn't like a kid turning into like prepubescent turning into high school you know whatever right it wasn't that transition but i really feel like the office let people grow into smarter adults and better adults even though they kept the consistent comedy of it mm -hmm. so it's just a good show on that level but also just like a show about office politics <laughs> <laughs> there's this episode where People could not remember if Stanley had a mustache. <laughs> and they're like, yo, we see our coworker every day. <laughs> Why can we not remember if he has a mustache or not? And then as it was happening, it was like the 30 second like cold, cold open. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, does Stanley have a mustache? <laughs> I can't remember. Like it's such a good show about just like little like office moments like that where you, you interact with people every day and Sometimes you don't even really look at their face. <laughs> so I feel like it's just such a good show on so many levels. And there are so many, like, good Michael Scott-isms in my life. <laughs> my favorite, us, one, my favorite. favorite one to say is, I am not to be truffled with. <laughs> <laughs> truffled? <laughs> Shout out to the for, office. For the, for the entire office. Yes. All right. We did it. We hey. did it. We did it. So we're going to get you into a studio to huh? record the Google That song. Oh, my God. Google that shit. Hey, hey Google that shit. Hey. hey. We're going to do that. So We need um, a producer on that beat. 
DJ Where? Mustard hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> mustard on the beat. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Thank you to Teak Milan for coming through and dropping all the gems. Shout out to the Pod Squad. Pod Squad. Shout out to Jenna Weiss Berman. Eleanor Julia Kagan. Eleanor Kagan. Paul Ruest. <laughs> Let me tell you, Paul's in here with no sleeves, just flexing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Paul ain't got a single sleeve to yeah. his name today. And He's a single worry. <laughs> no Paul sleeves, got no, no worries. worries. <laughs> <laughs> um, shout out to Argo Studios. Yes. And shout out to our um, in-house band, kind of, maybe? Not in-house. Probably not. <laughs> Jean Grey and to Don Will of the Almighty Tanya Morgan for making us the best music. What else? If you have questions, comments, um, if you need advice, if you want to tell us how dope you think we are, <laughs> send us an email at another round at BuzzFeed.com. And as always, you can find us on Another Round at Facebook, Twitter, and Another Round at BuzzFeed.com. Follow Heaven on Twitter at Heaven Like the Noun, Rants Like the Verb, <laughs> Heaven Rants. Shout out to Tracy at Brokey McPoverty, still the best Which Twitter is name of all time. Truer than I wish it was. <laughs> send me a dollar, maybe. Can yeah, I? Send us some money. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for listening, y'all. Get some fruit in your life. Yes. Call your mom. Drink some water. Stretch. Take, meds. Take all of your meds. Listen, I'm like two days out from mine. I'm not all right. Plus, my period's about to start, too. I'm insane. Tracy, get it together. I'm trying. It's I am on my meds. Failing. I'm so proud of myself. Yay! Woo! See y'all next week. Look me in my face. I ain't got no words. I ain't got no words. I ain't got no words. See them strumming keep me up. So I ain't got no words. I ain't got no words. I ain't got no worries. You see money. Two kind, Sam. <laughs> you leap on the back of the wind. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was Tracy's impression of Dean Thank Alan you. Greer's Thank impression you. of Maya Angelou. <laughs> I'm clapping for myself. This is me you hear right now. All so we I do is impressions it. of impressions on this show. <laughs> because we can't do straight up impressions at all. <laughs> <laughs>